to be here. Thanks for having me. So after about four years of calculating mortality rates and uh, reviewing embedded values for insurance companies, I thought to myself, surely there's other uses for some of the ac analytics and modeling techniques that we're using in insurance, um, and surely we can apply them to other industries. A recent Bain and Company study uh, found, found that 4% of global companies were, were truly excellent at analytics. And they found that this 4% of companies were twice as likely to be top performers financially in their industry, three times more likely to execute decisions as intended, and five times more likely to make decisions faster. So if the advantage or the benefit of being excellent at analytics is so great, why are so few companies or organizations achieving it? A recent KPMG study found that there were three major challenges to implementing data analytics in an organization. The first was simply collecting the data. Do we have the right data? Collecting data has a cost, so you want to make sure what you're collecting has value. I think talk about big analytics over the last few years, 80% of which is unstructured, has caused some corporate executives to think, well, we need to gather and collect more data. The truth is, they're not sure yet what to do with it. Number two was organizations didn't feel that they had the right tools or talent to make that data count. Organizations are complex, and many organizations have lots of legacy systems that were originally developed for applications that, that are now obsolete. So an executive might think, well, the solution here is let me get an enterprise system, let me aggregate the data, process the data better, but then they realize they didn't have the people, the talent, to actually drive value-generating solutions. The third obstacle was what do we do with it? How do we turn this data, how do we turn these tools, how do we guide these, these talented individuals to actually create value? Because ultimately, as we've heard already today, this whole process needs to drive value. So just a simple concept um, that I want to introduce, we've, we've touched on it a little bit already this morning, is the whole concept of a data value cycle, which is simply saying you start with data, how do you move to insights, which you know, it could take the form of predictive modeling, maybe it's just simply better reporting, um, some kind of better understanding of relationships, correlations, whatever it might be, taking those insights and then turning it into some kind of business action. If there's no action, there's no benefit, which is the third area, the fourth area, apologies. There needs to be some kind of profitable outcome that we measure, feedback, and then continually improve. So starting with the analytical function, Turning data to insights. Peter, come take a look at this. Mr. Daniels. Mr. Daniels. Look at this. What's this? The numbers, they keep getting bigger and bigger. The clicks are off the charts. Yeah. Yoshi, it's Walter. We're back. Yes, sir! I I need more trees. More trees? I'll get you more trees. Hey, take a look at Wood Pulp. Whoa. Everything you got on Wood Pulp right now. He really loves that thing. love that, that advert because it really drives home the point that you need to get the basics right. They've got a great uh, web analytics tool, but it's just a pity their reports weren't looking at maybe unique IP addresses, or maybe their interpretation of those reports um, weren't looking at just one single metric. So the bottom line, if you want to get from data to insights, you need to start by getting the basics right. Another concept I want to introduce is the idea of of the analytics continuum, what I call the analytics continuum. And we've spoken about a few of these aspects of analytics during the course of the morning, but it's nice to, to chart it and to see that we can actually put all of these different tools and techniques into a chart where we've got degrees of, of competitive advantage on the one side and then levels of difficulty to actually achieve um, that analytical um, uh, output. So to give you an idea of what I mean as we talk from, from reporting to optimization, let's assume we're a retailer. So a retailer would, would be receiving reports, 
Maybe they see that the reports are showing some kind of uh, uh, reduction in sales. What they do then is they do a query drill down and they identify that certain SKUs are performing more, more poorly than others. So what do they do? They apply some statistical analysis. What they see, that actually there's cu certain customer profiles, certain types of customers are starting to buy less of those SKUs. Their basket size, sizes are reducing. And there's also some kind of correlation to stores that had a recent store layout change. So what's the next step? Well, let's forecast forward. How do those trends impact the future? We can quickly identify with Christmas coming up that maybe we need to reduce our orders so that we don't have uh, excess stock sitting in the warehouse and creating some kind of a working capital problem. That's forecasting. We then move to predictive modeling where we say, what kind of interventions can we apply to, to change that trend or to change the behavior of, of those customers? Maybe it's, it's targeted offers, maybe it's changing the store layout, possibly it's, it's better price optimization on those SKUs in particular stores. And then finally we move over to you know, what's often seen as the holy grail, optimization. How can we offer the right offer to the right customer at the right time? Now, complicated analytics, the predictive modeling and optimization, I mean, those really are the, the holy grails of data analytics. But I'd say, depending on where you are as an organization, you need to focus on, on doing what you currently do and do it well. So if currently you've just got reports and you're thinking to yourself, goodness, I'm nowhere near predictive analytics, my suggestion to you would be get your reporting done right. Very often what we find with, with some of our clients is just the report stink that they need to look at revamping their reports. Maybe they should be looking at better metrics. Um, I often suggest reviewing the reports that you're looking at every four to six months because the market changes and, and metrics need to, need to catch up. So wherever you are, make sure you're doing the basics right. Another as aspect of moving insights into, into action is asking the right questions. We had a, um, an airtime reseller client uh, a couple years ago, and we were engaged initially to answer the question, how do we retain more of the tens of thousands of low-value customers that just kept churning through the business? And doing a simple customer value um, analysis, we found out that actually 7% of their customers were generating 50% of value. So very quickly, the problem changed from trying to retain that, that low-value tens of thousands of customers to how do we retain the high-value customers and identify similar profiled customers whose value we can also increase. So you need to make sure you're asking the right questions. So you need to be creative if you're starting this data journey. If we're moving now from insights to action, just a couple points I quickly wanted to make um, about that is, first of all, in your organization, you need a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. If you're not encouraging your staff or your teams to think out the box, they're never gonna come up with, with cutting edge solutions. Also, there needs to be room for failure. A test and learn environment is critical. Your organization needs to have the agility to be able to, to, to test certain uh, new theories or new hull, hull, uh, null hypotheses, and then to see which ones work, and then to optimize. One of the answers that I find most frustrating from clients and, and even staff is when I ask, why are we doing something this way? And the answer is, well, it's because we've always done it that way. That's a sure sign that you don't have the right culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in your organization. So then moving from action to result. Obviously, this, this, uh, this process of, of, of creating insights from data, turning it into action, it has to be grounded in some kind of an output. And then for most organizations, that output is the bottom line, it's profits. So in what way are we encouraging our teams to keep the bottom line in focus? Analytics, if you're a little geeky like myself, they can be super distracting because there's so much that's interesting, but not everything that's interesting is useful. So make sure that you're focusing on the useful pieces of information. Remember that you also need to build in that measurement loop. You need to make sure that somehow you're capturing the data, you're capturing the results, and feeding that back so you can continually optimize, can continually optimize your processes. Now, changing the topic slightly, talking about talent and tools. An example I often like to use is, is the difference between a Boeing and a car. 
So if you're trying to get from point A to point B, what will be the best way to get there? Well, if you've got really skilled pilots, lots of fuel, and a nice airstrip, lots of money, maybe a Boeing is the best way to get there. But typically, we don't. Typically, we might have a car or two, and we've certainly got some people who can drive. So maybe the best option for now is to get in a car and to drive from Cape Town to Joburg. You might take 14 hours to get there, a lot slower than a Boeing, but, but I'm guaranteeing you that you will get there. And that brings up the whole point of you don't necessarily need the latest and greatest expensive tools to, to be competitive in the analytics space. Two very quick examples. We did some work um, earlier on in the year for an education provider who was struggling to reconcile some of their systems. We simply extracted the data, and within the course, literally, of a couple days, we managed to discover what the problems were and also identify certain uh, opportunities for moral hazard amongst their sales force so that we could change their business processes. For an insurance company, they were struggling because of all their legacy systems. They were struggling to create a single customer view. Again, extracted all the data from the enterprise systems, and in the matter of four weeks, we had a, had a, had a really useful single customer view for them that, that, that could enable them to, to better target um, and better product develop. So what does it take to be a good analyst? Well, I've jotted down six points here that, that I think are useful. The first is a willingness to grow the toolbox of skills. Your team needs to continually be learning there's so much information out there. There's so many new tools and techniques. You need to be learning what's out there and learning from others. Secondly, you need your analysts to understand the context. MIS departments shouldn't just be robotic, doing what's said or asked. Instead, they should be providing information that's needed. Thirdly, they need to be able to provide clarity. Clarity from, from the technology and the science and the data through to the business implication. Also, they need to be efficient. They need to be able to optimize their processes. So often I hear from clients that, okay, we can't implement this new solution because the warehouse, um, the warehouse just doesn't have the production capacity. My question would be, well, what is the warehouse currently doing? And is everything really necessary? Then they need to be good problem solvers. Your analysts really need to be good problem solvers. In our recruitment processes, we, we focus not on, on what skills they have, not what codes they can currently developing, but rather, if, rather looking at the way they think. And if you can, better if you can isolate the people um, who think the best and solve problems the most efficiently, those are the kind of people that you want to attract. It's easy to teach them how to code in R, um, but it's hard to teach someone how to think. And then thirdly, they need to be, or, or finally, sorry, they need to be resourceful and curious. The truth is, if you find anyone who's good at or scores 10 out of 10 in all of these areas, please let me know because there's not many people like this. So what do you need to do? You need to be building teams that have people with strengths in each of these areas so that your team can be, can be um, competitive, can be coming up with these solutions that can really drive value for your organization. One of the ways to do that is to really celebrate our geekiness. It's been mentioned a few times. Some of us here might be a little nerdy, a little geeky. There's nothing wrong with that. In my opinion, in my opinion, um, the nerds here are the, the superheroes or the rock stars of organizations of the future. And that needs to be honored. We've got a, a, a crazy little culture where I work, uh, a cube culture. Everyone in the office can solve the Rubik's Cube. 95% can solve it in less than four minutes. And we often have inter-office uh, competitions to see who can solve the Rubik's Cube the fastest. In fact, we're sponsoring uh, co-sponsors of the, uh, the national champs next weekend. If you want to Google it and attend, it'll be great to have you. Um, another way we do that is, uh, is, is through what we call 80 Talks. We regularly get together and we discuss the projects we're on, the things we're doing, different things that we're learning, um, and we often throw in competitions. Here's an example of one competition uh, that we gave a, a few weeks ago, and you could submit for a, for a prize. I won't go into the details. This is one of the submissions from, from one of the, uh, the new recruits in the team. And uh, when run on a small data set, it gave the answer in a few minutes, but when run on the, the sort of 10 million, uh, 10 million row data set that, that we were testing it on, we had to kill it after, after a couple hours because it just wasn't producing uh, the answer. But this was the winning solution. So from, from that solution to this, we could actually spend the hour going through the different sets of code and trying to better understand what techniques should we be applying to help make our coding more efficient 
So we don't have that problem of saying, well, we don't have enough production capacity over the weekend to run that new process. Maybe we just need to be doing things better. So then I hope, I hope my time's been interesting. Um, if there's one takeaway, I'd like you to think, as, as an organization, where can you start in the data journey? Whereabouts are you in that analytics continuum? And wherever you are, s start trying to get the basics right. Start with what you have and develop a strategy to slowly progress up that continuum so that you can become more competitive over time. There's, there's, there's no excuse for, there's, there's no substitute for hard work. You can't leapfrog to optimization. You need to be building the teams, you need to be building the thinking within your organization to be able to drive that value. Thanks for your time.